the maturity model to try and help companies understand where they are, but more importantly, what they need to do to improve their security. So I'm sure this will be discussed and many other things as well on the panel. And I'd like to welcome up uh, Jess from VMware, who um, Jesse is going to be moderating the panel. So Jesse. You guys can come on up. <laughs> All right, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's session, where we'll be diving into the security and technical challenges, as well as best practices when it comes to implementing XR in the enterprise. I'm super excited because we have a great group of panelists up here today that have truly been through it all and can hopefully provide you with some insights and advice that you can take back to your organization. So I'll let JB, Kurt, Michael, and Ricardo introduce themselves, but first I'd like to ask the audience a couple questions um, so our panelists can get a better sense of who all is out in the audience today and what information will be most relevant to this group. So if I can get a show of hands when it comes to XR, who here is just starting to look into it or are in the early investigation stage? All right, we got quite a few. How about currently testing or in the pilot phase? All right, and then who here has already rolled out and is in production? All right, quite a few too. And finally, most important question, who here is already ready for lunch? <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> All right, now I'll let everyone introduce themselves. JB, why don't we get started with you? Yeah, thank you, Jesse. Um, I'm JB Farge, I work for SEPC7. We are basically the plumbers of the sea, the way I like to introduce it. We basically do engineering, uh, fabrication, transportation, and installation of subsea structure and pipeline from the seabed to the surface. And I've been doing XR for subsea 7 for about six years now. Yeah. Hi, good, uh, good morning or good afternoon, right? <laughs> I am uh, Michael Zarat, uh, and I'm with uh, General Dynamics IT. Uh, so we're uh, focused on supporting our government and defense cu uh, customers from um, manufacturing platforms uh, to our division where we do systems integration and uh, professional services. And uh, I'm, I have a new role. I'm the uh, solutions director for 5G and spatial computing, which is a, a new role for myself as well as in the company. So uh, I think there's a lot of interest and uh, we're seeing a lot of more demand from uh, our customers, both internal and, and external. So. All right, so I'm Ricardo. I work for Kimberly Clark in Latin America. Uh, I'm based actually in Brazil and Sao Paulo. I'm the manager of digital manufacturing for all the um, uh, manufacturing operations in, in Latin America. Um, I have been in this role for the last six years, um, responsible for bringing and, and implement technology that's related for Industry 4.0 for all the uh, our, our 12 mills that we have in Latin America. It's an honor to be here and sharing those, those things with you. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Kurt Scheringer. I'm our uh, North American principal spatial computing prototyping architect, very long title, uh, for Amazon Web Services. And primarily what my team focuses on is, um, you know, how do we help our customers when they come to us with problems, especially in spatial compute? Whether it's big problems, blockers, my team usually helps bringing together a set of vendors and partners, many of which you actually find here, to help kind of build their solutions, hear about their use cases, and really work backwards to, to solve problems. Uh, my experience actually is very heavily in spatial data systems, and you'll hear probably in some of the answers today I'll give uh, relating to that. Um, and I have a long history uh, coming from Lockheed Martin, where I worked there 13 years also doing spatial compute. Thanks, everyone. And I'm Jesse Stokes. I'll be your moderator for today. I'm a product line marketing manager at VMware, where I focus on our XR solutions. So at VMware, what we're really trying to do is help our customers stage, manage, and support any XR device at scale with our Workspace ONE unified endpoint management platform. So we can do that alongside any other device, whether it be a mobile device or a laptop. Um, and we, so we're really focused on management, really focused on security, which is why we're sponsoring this session today. We also have tools on top of our platform that enable you to um, create an enterprise grade user experience with customization controls as well as access and identity controls. So we'll go ahead and get started with our session.
All right, so Michael, my first question is for you. Um, I can't think of anyone that probably faces more stringent security requirements than you at General Dynamics. Can you talk us through some of the challenges that you've had from an IT and data security perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think we've we've kind of attacked uh, the challenges in kind of three different, uh, I'll say, kind of modalities. So one would be, um, you know, data on the end user device, the network, and then uh, whether that's the cloud or the edge device uh, and, and approaching security concerns uh, from all three layers. Um, what I've, uh, you know, personally been focused on was been more on the network and uh, the end user device management. Uh, and that's where we've seen a lot of challenges where um, the networks, the monitoring, the, the firewalls, the controls um, that are in place are really designed for, you know, uh, quite frankly, a Windows PC, right? And so when you have um, a wearable device, it's not just, uh, you know, a, an iPhone or an Android, uh, a mobile tablet, um, a wearable device that has all different types of sensors and is, you know, out of the box designed to use a lot of different protocols, um, many of which are really optimized for IP6 versus IP4. So um, you really, uh, we found advantage of, of making um, pilot and, and um, test networks to really um, see these things in action and then understand what that behavior is before starting to release those out into, uh, into production, into your, uh, whether that's your corporate or your, um, your customer's uh, secure networks. So that was kind of one of our lessons learned, but certainly on the management side, um, you know, trying to apply policies that are appropriate for a desktop PC will really uh, break your, your your augmented reality or VR devices, um, regardless of kind of what operating system they're using. So you really have to approach it uh, kind of as a as a new uh, as a new type of device and a new type of service that needs to be uh, managed with its own set of tools. Kurt, coming over to you now. I know at AWS you spent a lot of time working and consulting with customers to implement XR. Um, what are some of the big, biggest challenges that you've seen? So for sure, and, and so for Amazon Web Services, our, our biggest things that we care about, right, is storage, processing of that data. And when you start looking at spatial data, which includes a lot of 3D, even 2D, it does process very differently than textual data that we've processed a lot of times in the past. There's many new tools that we're seeing our customers using, as many of you know, especially when you look at 2D, especially 3D content editing. Um, and just overall, you know, there's a lot of different 3D data sources and enterprises that a lot of times in the past were gate kept, meaning they're designers that only had access to PLM systems. And now we're finding with kind of the democratization of XR, we're now seeing devices in the hands of operators on the floor, different associates, your manufacturing engineers. And with that, now they need access to this data that previously was gate kept behind so many different PLM systems, different types of engineering systems, you name it. So as part of this, uh, you know, one of the things that we're looking for to solve is how do we start aggregating a lot of this data, spatial data that has to be treated differently, use different tools, is fairly large, distribution is very cumbersome, into kind of a concept now we're, we're calling spatial data planes. So think of it kind of as a data lake, in this case specifically for 3D data, and a control plane on top of it where you can start managing your workflows, how the data that comes in and out, aggregating data between these systems. But more importantly, now that you have so many people accessing this data lake of, of spatial data, you now have access controls and security that becomes very important. Before you had those gate kept systems, now you have a central place that you have to manage it, no different than some of the legacy uh, data lake systems uh, that, that we've seen in the past. So that's one of the big areas. The other area that we've seen is uh, from a content perspective, you have a lot of tools, especially the vendors that we see here on the floor. A lot of them have their built-in content management systems. Enterprises today are deploying not just one of these tools, but several of them, especially if there's multiple divisions, multiple areas, multiple teams, as you know, they're all implementing these different ones. So we're trying to look at now how do we start at least, again, aggregating and working with these partners and vendors to bring the data together. We're not trying to consolidate the tool set, we're just trying to bring the data together so if one team uses one tool and another this other one, that at least the data can flow between them and you don't have these silos of data, you don't have you know, obsolescence issues when some of these tools potentially go away or get absorbed. Um, so those are some of the big areas that, that we are certainly looking at. 
as part of distribution of that, some of the challenges that we're looking at is because these data sizes are large, network conditions at a lot of these large enterprises may not be up to par yet. Um, so some of the solutions that we have been looking at integrating right now is everything from still remote rendering uh, all the way to streaming of data through 3D tiles. So there's some new standards now that came out by the Open Geospatial Consortium called 3D Tiles. That's some new areas for how we can start streaming content to displays, as well as still using some remote rendering solutions. But overall, um, the, that's one of the main areas I would say that we are heavily looking at is how do we manage better the storage, the processing, and the overall distribution of that data. Nice. JB, as someone who's been using XR for a couple years now at sub C7, um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced when you first start, started your deployment, and then what are some of the ongoing challenges you still face today? Yeah, if I can, taking it back to the beginning where the wow factor was not a problem, but as soon as you were trying to uh, register on the network a HoloLens 2, that they had no idea it was a Windows 10 PC that had to have their own uh, device management system, it was, it was interesting. Uh, how many people show of hand in, in, in the crowd are in IT? Not many, right? And so my, my biggest challenge was to understand the requirement that IT, IT had in my company for what I wanted to implement. And so it, it took long conversation, long, long, uh, basically undertaking what was this safety concern, not only safety, but like data concern. And that helped me basically understanding that I needed to map out the data as the data was going through this different system that I was trying to implement. Uh, to understand what was the, the potential risk that the data will be exposed to. Um, so that was the major, the major challenge, is understanding how, that, well, if I want to introduce a management device, a device management software, well, it has going to have to be for something that's very robust and does it scale. Do we have, can we support it? Introducing it is never the problem. Supporting it is usually the problem, um, especially if you scale. And you can hear all the stories about the quest and, and how some of the business management around the device management uh, didn't go so well. So yeah, that would be my, my main, that was my main uh, challenge at the time. Nowadays, it's much more trying to understand, because you have, you, have, you have some um, interesting regulation, like if you actually use a whole lens 2 in Europe and you're not entirely sure how GDPR uh, gets into the, 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 the picture, like these are the things that you don't necessarily think, but that will have an implication if you're a multinational company. So these are the things that I would, I would highly encourage you to get into. Yeah. Thanks. Ricardo, you tried a smart glasses pilot for um, remote support a couple years ago that didn't work out. Why didn't this pilot work for you? What other technologies outside of XR are uh, Kimberly, Kimberly Clark looking into, I know you mentioned Industry 4.0. Um, and then lastly, what needs to change in order for XR to work for your particular environment and use case? Yeah, th that's right. So a couple of years ago, um, we, we, we tried an initiative to um, use wear glasses and, um, and at the shop floor, right? So we want you to have like a remote access um, um, support uh, from, from our SMEs here in the US, in, down in, in, in Brazil and in the shop floor, right? So um, everyone was excited because that time, so okay, we are using wear, wearable glasses, so first time we were doing that, so everyone was excited. And then, did it work? No, right? And, and why? So the, the question is, why it didn't work? So there are two main reasons I want to mention here. The first one is we are not able to connect in, on the internet, right? And then come back to you a little bit, what you just mentioned, that uh, there's uh, security reasons, and the company has policies that, that uh, I work for, for on, on the manufacturing is like end user perspective, and we didn't know that. So, we could not connect our um, device, this device that we bought, on the, the, the internet, right? So there's policy we, we, did, we didn't know, right? So that was the first takeaway. There's, on top of that, there is a couple other problems in terms of uh, the, the Wi-Fi was not uh, stable at the, the shop floor, and also coverage area was also not, not, not good that time. 
The second point is the um, device also was not robust enough to work, right? So that time uh, we tried it at the office. So okay, we could listening day very well. We 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 could hear, uh, we could speak, and they can, could hear uh, us okay at the office. But when we went down there to the shop floor, uh, it's it's a noise environment, right? So we could not hear what they are saying. They could not like uh, listening what we are saying. And then, okay, it didn't work. So the lesson learned for that and what our, uh, our takeaway was, okay, so guys, we need to understand. So we need to go close to the IT team and understand. So what, what, what is the, 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 the rules? What I need to get? So do I need, so the device was not approved for IT. So I need to approve that device for IT. Uh, follow all the, the, the safety rules and regulations from the company and understand that. So that, that was uh, the first thing. And the second thing is, so, okay, so that was five years ago. So I haven't seen here a lot of the different uh, devices already. So they, they move it. So we need to go and consider that um, uh, I know the factors of using the device. That's, that's a noise environment. So I have to consider a device that works in... In, in that environment. So that's the path we're going and looking, okay, so what is the device we want? So what is the rules we have? And then, uh, and then move forward with that. Nice, thank you. Kurt, you mentioned remote rendering or remote streaming. Can you dive further into the benefits and best practices for this, as well as any future considerations that all of us here should be keeping in mind, such as Gen AI? Sure, and so I'll approach those uh, kind of separately. So previously I was talking, you know, if you have a centralized system, or even if you don't have a centralized system, I mean, some of the benefits of remote rendering, essentially you're taking an application, putting it on a server, it's doing all the processing on the server, um, and then streaming it out to the client has many benefits. From a security perspective, you're not sharing your data with your devices anymore, uh, you don't have to download large files, um, there's also, from a performance aspect, a lot of times, as many content creators know, you have to tweak your content to be performant on the device you're targeting. At least with remote rendering and even remote streaming, uh, you can kind of avoid some of those steps and you can even render you know, millions, sometimes even billions of polys depending on the processing power of the compute you have behind the scenes. Now some of the drawbacks in those areas is you still need uh, good bandwidth and low latencies for those types of systems, especially remote rendering. Um, also, from a processing power uh, perspective, you do need to make sure that you have enough GPU compute on both sides. A lot of times we're seeing now our customers are pushing some of that back to the edge, especially because of their network conditions. So they're running local edge server hardware again that's basically doing the remote rendering to their local uh, edge devices or headsets. Um, so that's remote rendering. Uh, remote streaming, which is basically streaming Octree 3D tiles. Uh, it's a little different. You are streaming the data, but it does need relatively low bandwidth. Latency is not as sensitive there if you have high latency networks. Um, and really the use cases there are if you're going through some of these content management systems, you're quickly even looking through the content. You want to see which one's the right one. You need to look at the 3D model ahead of time. Um, those are really popular because now you can quickly see what you're looking at without having to do any further conversions on the data also can be used to stream directly to headsets and do basically real-time level of detail uh, uh, tailoring based on the device it is going to. So those are just some of the benefits and some of the things that we're seeing for sure in, in both those areas. When we start talking about generative AI, uh, specifically even spatial generative AI, we're looking at now the analysis of a lot of this 3D data that is sitting on the server. Some of this data may be on the headset and we can use edge-based foundational models that are running there that's, you know, basically take an iPhone, scan the room, you're taking a point cloud and now start analyzing, you know, what are chairs, what are TV screens, what are people. Uh, some of that can be done on device. Some of the more processor, uh, uh, processor intensive ones can be sent to a server. If you are running, for example, remote rendering, remote streaming, in combination with that, you can keep a lot of that now on the server. You have more processing power, whether in the cloud or on your edge device, and now you can run some of those more uh, computationally heavy foundational models still on a server rather than at the edge. And it's kind of a, a mix between the two. Um, but we are finding now that previously you saw a lot of the inference on these models, especially large language models in the cloud. Now it's being pushed again to the edge for smaller type models, um, which 
has some limitations, but also a lot of performance gains when it comes to uh, latency and response. I mean, some of you will know, you know, you talk into a large language model, it takes sometimes five, 10 seconds, depending on which APIs you're using to get a response. Some of that can be lessened again by moving those edge models to the device. So there's a give and take there, but there's a lot there um, and certainly a deep topic that we, that we could dive into. Thanks, great points. Michael, switching gears over to you now. At VMware, most of our customer deployments are shared by multiple users or employees. And there's a lot of care and consideration that comes with managing shared devices because especially when it comes to AR, VR, um, you know, they have a very unique interaction paradigm that is not comparable to a mobile device or a laptop. So um, it's really important that these headsets be configured and managed in a way that can not only secure it, but provide the best possible end user experience um, in terms of, you know, whether that be customizing the UI, locking it down, enabling check in, check out, SSO, things like that. Can you comment more on shared XR and the best approach to managing these devices? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, the, the biggest hurdle has been, honestly, the, the, the cost of the individual devices, right? Otherwise, if it was inexpensive, hey, everybody gets a HoloLens, right? But uh, unfortunately, the reality is, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, return on investment, and you talk about, um, you know, using these probably at most maybe a half an hour at a time to complete one task. It just doesn't make sense to have everybody, you know, maybe in the future, everybody has an Apple headset like our phones. I don't know, but that, that's not the world that at least I'm living in right now so um, you know we, we have to share devices uh, and it's mostly kind of task based right um, like I have an application I have a, a workflow or I'm using this because I have a problem so I need to you know phone an expert or I need to um, get you know detailed instructions to fix uh, something that broke um, and, and I think a lot of the challenges are with you know the devices depending on how you have them configured right um, they lock out they require password resets um, you know the regular care and feeding that a, a typical mobile device would have that someone is using you know to check your email every five seconds versus um, you know our typical hololens you know on a good day might be used once a day right so um, when you know they're sitting idle sometimes they don't get plugged in right and then that's okay now I need to use it and now I have to wait you know two hours for this thing that to charge so just um, you know training folks on standard procedures and and trying to have kind of um, you know very low tech but like your laminated plaque hey plug this in when you're done um, you know and and sometimes having you know system passwords trying to save those things or using um, pins where you can and biometric where possible, um, and, and also um, multi-factor with, uh, you know, other types of soft tokens that are more system-oriented. Um, but, you know, there's a push and pull with security because, um, you know, the practicality is you don't necessarily want every user to have an account on that device if they're only going to use it, you know, once a quarter. And one thing I'll real fast chime in on is a lot of folks are still doing essentially shared accounts on these devices. I mean, right now it's inevitable, but one of the things I will say as a call to action is, you know, let's work with the device vendors. There's got to be better solutions to put in place in order to prevent shared accounts. The government is pushing a uh, zero trust architecture now. It's been mandated by the federal government. That'll start getting pushed down to probably all the contractors and all the suppliers, I would imagine, at some point. Essentially, that'll eliminate any, uh, I would say, usability of even having a shared account, shared device. Um, it'll really matter at that point where the devices are registered, who has access to them, and who has access to the downstream or upstream uh, data services as part of that. So, you know, I really implore everyone, you know, work with your device manufacturers to start putting in your requirements uh, to start making it better kind of for all of us so we, we don't have to do shared accounts or shared devices anymore when it comes to login information. Thank you both. Great points. Um, JB, you brought up a lot of good points earlier, and I know when we talked earlier this month, you were excited to be on this panel and connect with the audience, because just a couple of years ago, you were on the other side of your deployment, and I remember you said you had so many questions and weren't always getting the right answers that you needed, and that came with some frustrations. Looking back, what did you learn and what are some best practices that you can share to those in the audience who might be in the same boat, navigating the unknown, having the same questions and frustrations you had? I think the answer is twofold. Uh, the first one, what I got, where, where, so my first EWTS back in the day was uh, 2017 or 18, and then I came in, had a lot of questions, um, 
it was not as networky as it is now, I guess. And so I found somebody on a panel that was from um, Pfizer. Uh, actually, he was doing a presentation from Pfizer. And he was exactly explaining what my problem was. And I was like, I need to talk to this guy. So I, off of stage, like, hey, I need to talk to you. I know you're probably busy, but let me, let me ask you those five questions to answer. And what is the process? Because one thing that I had struggled, that I struggled with at the time was understanding the process from, OK, I have my 3D model. How do I get from there to there? Um, encompassing all the different uh, between software, hardware, security, and all the good stuff. Um, so that will be the first answer. Now, when it comes to, uh, so we, I, you were talking about uh, device management, Michael, and there is a thing that we, I was talking to, uh, to IT about. It's like, I don't want to buy hardware every six months and having it obsolete in the next three. I don't want to be in that business. So just like you don't care, I mean, most of the companies here don't buy, well, don't really, they don't, please don't really care about the, uh, the computer. It's there, it works, it doesn't work, go, go back to IT, get another one. It's almost, what if we could get to that, to that element? Um, so there are some solutions, depending on your IT provider, but basically that uh, can give you almost a, a, a vending machine type of deal, where you have your headset, you log in, you take it out, and you log it back, and then obviously there are, there are some, uh, some application behind this, but this is the, uh, uh, this is the long-term vision, I guess, right? This is past, your, you've done your pilot, yeah, it works. Um, how do I get to the next step? So now going back to um, how, what would be the, the nuggets that I would give back, so like make sure that you understand how your data flows from point A to point B um, and, and basically map where the problems could be between either the systems you have, the silo you have, the, the security you may, you may need, and, and things like this. This is where I would go, yeah. Just adding for 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 that um, um, uh, that answer. So, a couple of things from from my end user perspective in the manufacturing. A couple lessons learned that we we, we had was, um, uh, for example, we had to understand that. So we had to implement a lot of uh, technologies, and um, we we face things like, as I said, like security policies. That's one thing. But uh, how do you do? Like how do you protect your data? Because IT was all about, okay, so if you wanted to implement another technology, how, how do you going to connect with our system? How do you protect the, our database? How do you protect our system? And even the vendor, whoever is, is making the solution, right? So how they are going to sign in uh, to the system is going to be one on their system, and our, our system, how do you connect? So those are kind of uh, lessons that we learned trying to implement in pilot, and we have to consider for, for for the following uh, technology we implemented. Ricardo, when it comes to the new and emerging technologies that you're implementing as part of your for industry 4.0 strategy, um, what do you feel is the most effective way to help your organization not only anticipate, but respond most effectively to these changes? In other words, what questions are you asking? What framework have you put into place to ensure an effective change management strategy? Yeah, that that's a good question, and we, we, we as we, we are learning along the way, it's there's three points I want I want to mention here. The first thing is uh, uh, your uh, organization uh, needs to understand this is not an a um, um, option anymore. What I mean with that, your top leadership, your executives need to know um, um, we need to have a path or 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 strategy to adapt for new technologies and implementations, right? So it may sound like, uh, okay, but this is obvious, not that obvious, because one example, I was uh, implementing some uh, initiatives on, on Kimberly-Clark, and my team came to me and said, Ricardo, that it's not working, so the mules are not moving. They, are not, they, they don't want to implement those. They're, they're not prioritizing uh, these initiatives, okay? Uh, let me talk to their leaders and top management to understand what's happening. And what I figured out was they, they, didn't, they are not prioritized. They, they didn't understand what you're doing and what is the benefits to doing that. So there is, um, we need to make sure that they, they know, um, all the top leadership knows. They, they don't need to know the, uh, the uh, technical parts, but they, they need to understand what takes and what's our learning, what they need to adapt and how we need to go 
keep moving forward, right? So that was the first thing. And the second point is um, you need to focus what's your pain points and your problem and then find the technology, not vice versa, right? So um, that was a very funny story because uh, I heard here on this conference, like um, I was talking in lunch like uh, yesterday with a guy and he from, uh, I think from a manufacturing industry for, for, for um, automotive, I don't know if it was Honda, but he was telling me, so they, they have a scenario where they, their cycle time to produce a product was 12 weeks, right? So they, they, the, their customer was not satisfied and they said, okay, let's, let's reduce for 10 weeks. And the question is, how much is going to cost you to implement technology to reduce 10 weeks of your cycle time? It's going to cost like $50 million, okay? That is very expressive. Um, and really, how, how, much, how many weeks your, really your customers wants to be reduced to deliver the product? Two weeks. Okay, so if it's only two weeks, why you're trying to reduce 10 weeks and expand, like making like a huge expand on $50 million. So if you find like a different technology, not, it doesn't need to be state enough of, of art, so you can find like another technology that is going to cost you $2 million, you're going to reduce your two weeks and then you deliver the thing. Right, so you you solve the problem. So it's important to focus what's your problem, what you wanted to solve, and then find the technology. And the third point that um, 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 we we are working is is in terms of do partnership inside your organization first between your business uh, uh, function areas. What do I mean with that? So we are in operations. We want to make things happen. We we try to find a solution. We are the end users. But when you go to start like an implementing technology, you need IT team, right? So we don't know architecture, we don't know coding, we don't know uh, how to integrate with our, our system security support. So what we learned is we need to partnership with them and have these uh, uh, combined um, uh, work together to be successfully. So, Recently, we have an initiative to uh, use virtual um, uh, reality for maintenance inspection. So the guy from operation went out there, find a, a solution, find a vendor. He wants to implement. That was very perfect what he wanted. When he went to implement, he faced this problem. We could not like integrate it with the, our system because we didn't consider that. So we have to play uh, together, so this partnership is not just not one time, but we have to understand what's the requirements from your company in IT and operations, and this becomes like more and more like common uh, for implement any technology. It's not just like operations in IT; it's it, it, it needs to go together. The strategy needs to go together, and that's our. Um, uh, learning. So those are the three points that I, I mentioned uh, in, in our learning and I share with you because that's based on our experience and how we are you're moving forward. On change management, if I can chime in, the, I, I, came, I come from the business of about 18 years of, uh, of experience in oil and gas. I, I was not, I didn't learn how to take a product and have it uh, or try to convince senior leadership that this is the product I need to sell because I'm technically an internal salesman when I'm doing that, right? And so change management is a huge two words. There are many books about it. I'm not going to rant about it, but just learn about it if you're doing that because you're going to need it. Yes, very true. All right, well, that concludes all the questions I had for today. I just want to thank our panelists. You guys all did a great job, a lot of great advice, a lot of great insights. I think the main takeaway that I got from today is there are still a lot of challenges for when it comes to XR in the enterprise. And we've seen a lot of challenges that have been around for years, been around for a while or ongoing. And then we also have some challenges that will be coming up in the future. Um, but I think, you know, although that sounds really daunting, all the guys up here are proof that you can make XR work for your use case. Um, you know, and there's 
the good news is that there's a lot of different hardware and software options out there that you can make work for your environment. You know, once you get the buy-in, once you get the networking and security and approvals in place, you can do this at scale. So wherever you are in your XR journey, I really encourage you to do the research, look into all your software and hardware options, and make sure you're talking with industry experts like JB mentioned, that's something that he did. So all of these guys up here are a great resource. If you have any questions about device management um, or security or just want to talk through your use case, definitely encourage you to stop by the VMware booth. We are at the front of the expo, located um, right behind Meta, right behind their wall. <laughs> so um, yeah, and I think we have time. We have time for questions. Does anyone have questions for the panelists? Are there any specific instances or case studies where security vulnerabilities in XR were exploited and what lessons can be learned from them? I got a couple more here if that one isn't appealing. I have, I have no, I, no, no, no such case in my, in my experience. Yeah, I will say uh, it's still almost too new. There's probably a few cases that have happened, but they usually stay under the radar, so I don't know if I can comment any of them that were sure. significant enough. Yeah, not, <clears throat> none that I'm, uh, yeah. I'm aware of. I think it's still a small enough surface that, you know, the folks out there haven't been uh, zeroing in on it. But uh, I, I will say it's definitely, you know, specifically on the software side, um, uh, the data traversing the network, a lot of that, you know, and work with your vendors on this, but, um, you know, checking in with licensing for software is, is something that we've seen um, that wasn't necessarily expected, that was a little bit different behavior than we've seen on mobile or on, on PCs where the XR loaded apps uh, are kind of phoning home to make sure that the software is licensed, which I get it, you know, I appreciate that. Um, but when you're in a closed network environment and then you can't run your app because, you know, a certain, uh, you know, endpoint is blocked, you know, that, that's, a, that's a challenge. So. Can I just... I probably shouldn't say this really, but when the first research, the area does research projects, and one of the first research projects we did was around security, and the team that did it actually did a scan on a device, I won't say the device, we got an ethical hacker and it took them 10 minutes to get the content off the device. Literally was as easy. Now things have changed, that was probably seven years ago. It was quite interesting. We talk a lot about trying to get devices into the infrastructure. We talk quite a bit about the content management, but you've actually got this device with all of these things capturing all this data. The kind of issues that you see, especially if your content or what you're building has got a lot of IP to it, that we probably haven't really scratched the surface yet. Are there issues around that, that or just personal concerns? I mean, from my perspective, <clears throat> we're, we're taking it, uh, you know, it's all about the network and controlling uh, the device and, and, you know, where it can phone home to and, and, and really, um, like I said, putting it in the lab environment and uh, monitoring it and kind of, you know, putting that in your little, you know, not a Faraday cage, but, you know, basically an aquarium and monitoring, hey, what is the normal behavior for this app and this device? And then, you know, um, deciding what's acceptable for, you, for your company's risk level and saying, you know, this, this is, is acceptable, this isn't, and then working with your vendors and seeing what, you know, you can block from, uh, you know, from, from an infrastructure and networking perspective. Yeah, just adding on that, so as a comment, so when you come to a device and then implement and, uh, for, for, for this, so we have to have an approval first from, from our area, right? So from, so I don't know the details, that's more IT security part, but um, that's what we try. So we, we try one device and, and did it connect it to our network because it was not allowed. So there's some procedure. So. The, the, the IT security area in our company has some procedures that need to be followed to and checking for how is the device protected, how is the data and, and, and things like that. So um, to be useful um, and approve it because we cannot use it just anything and, and it's more related for your our uh, our uh, network, right? So 
and, and, and if you go down for the industrial network, even worse, right? So you're protecting your data from your machines. That, that's like, that's, I know it's huge in, in our company. So we are not dealing, so our technology is more on an enterprise network that we are trying to um, implement things, not for, for the industrial network, for, for the machines. Uh, but when we have to get data, is there's a protocol, there is always standardized, so we can uh, protect the data and not affecting the also the performance of uh, machines. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add. I mean, I, I don't think it's just the network. Uh, I think that's your first you know line of defense, uh, but certainly on the, the endpoint management. And you know, I was, I was talking with Jesse earlier, and I said uh, one of the challenges that we face is. Let's let's take like a you know a Windows holographic device and you know your your network management your infrastructure your your knock your soft folks they know how to manage Windows PCs so they want to push out you know those AD policies that are appropriate for a, a desktop or a laptop to your you know AR device and it's going to break uh, so really kind of working with them to understand you know what the requirements are for these new sets of devices. We got time for one more. Um, XR devices seemingly don't easily connect to corporate Wi-Fi networks. How are you able to overcome this obstacle? Um, by working with IT, simply put. Um, just like Michael was saying. Um, yeah, so my experience with that was like, there was no policy to make any wearable uh, join, the, the, join the Wi-Fi, not, not the right certificates. Um, then we had to, like, we had to go to corporate IT and say, hey, we, got, we are going to need, in your, in your roadmap, this is going to happen. Because whether you like it or not, whether it's me or somebody else, it will come up. So be ready for it. And so it, it takes a while, just like everything that corporate does. Um, but it, it has to happen this way, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I'll just add that, uh, you know, we've really seen uh, private cellular and uh, new, you know, separate wireless networks for AR devices as, as um, you know, as expensive as an investment that is, uh, we're, we're seeing that as really being the key backbone to make deployments of these things successful because, again, existing Wi-Fi networks are developed for laptops that, you know, are, are in one place and then they get powered down and moved down, you know, largely to another. Uh, and, and cellular networks are designed for, for wearable things that are moving around and need that constant network. And, and I will say one of the biggest things why usually IT does not want to put these devices in the network is they don't have the security controls. You know, if they don't have proper authentication, encryption, um, that's usually your first big red flag to IT and they'll usually deny your devices. Other areas is mobile device management, especially if the device is not supportive of mobile device management or vice versa, whatever system you're using is not supportive of the device. Generally, IT departments are very locked into those systems and it's very hard for them to change. Um, so that's another area that we see that IT typically denies it. I always say, you know, make, I said this even last year, make friends with your IT department from the very get go. You know, if you can, uh, relay your requirements, work with them as you're choosing your device, because a lot of times what happens is the team chooses the device first, consults IT second, and now they've chosen a device that IT will not allow in your network, and now you have to do workarounds with widget networks or, you know, very locked down networks where it might only be able to call out to certain places, and even then, like, IT is very hesitant, or IT and cybersecurity. So from the get-go, work with your IT when choosing your device and the applications you're putting on them. And I would dare to say they don't have many friends, so they would, they would <laughs> pull like it. There's a question. Uh, Chris Rojas, Intuitive Surgical. <clears throat> uh, so you work with IT, you, your proof of concept works, you have buy-in, you're ready to move to the next step. But I heard change management. So when you're working with CAD models, you have designers who are constantly pushing out engineering changes. Are there any insights in how you think about that kind of revision control and pushing that out to devices, especially when you consider their networking and the device you choose, the, soft, the, the software you're running, and so forth? I mean, we're talking a little bit more about process there. Um, the main, so we do some design reviews for our code models. Um, and when we do this, we usually have the design, for the design team, the fabrication team, the, 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 construct, the third party fabricator for the big uh, subsea structure. Uh, one thing that we, don't, we, didn't have, we didn't figure out yet is when there is those reviews and we do some annotations, hey, we need to modify this. How does this go back to the original software? 
so that we actually have a list, a to-do list. That are like, this is very manual still. Um, so change management, the aspect on change management around that for me would be walk your designers into understanding why is it beneficial for them to do that. So to use the immersive review, what, what benefits will they get out of that, if that answers the question. Perfect. I'm just going to final, just Kurt, you were talking just one last little bit about um, single sign-on for devices and um, uh, zero trust. So again, just not harping on about the area, but we've actually done quite a nice infographic on zero trust. But the latest research project has actually built some Unity code that helps this single sign-on and allows you to wipe the device clear. So it's now, and I know a bunch of area members are actually trying it out. It's not perfect. We hopefully will eventually make it open source, but it is a big problem. And if anybody's interested in getting hold of that code, please just give me a shout on LinkedIn and stuff like that. So that's something we've definitely got and people can start to have a little look at. Anyway, it's been a, an amazing panel. Thank you very much, guys. We've got to move on to the next one, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you.